It's a pleasure today to have uh, Nat Krenzgagor here, who's a professor in computer science and synthetic biology uh, from the University of Newcastle. <coughs> Uh, he also directs the Interdisciplinary Computing and Complex Biosystems Group, as well as the Centre for Synthetic Biology and the, the Bioeconomy. Um, there's lots I could say about Matt. He's, he's very well renowned within the UK synthetic biology community. He actually holds one of the, the tenure chairs in uh, emerging technologies from the UK uh, Royal Academy of Science. Um, what I think is really interesting from my perspective about the, the work that Matt does is he's working kind of the interface of synthetic biology and computing. Um, he's done a lot of work in sort of DNA, RNA, nanotechnology, as well as bringing sort of aspects of machine intelligence into that. So I think today he's going to give us a, an overview of some of the new stuff that he's been working on. Um, and so I'll, I'll hand over to... Thank to you very much. How, how long is, the, is, is it talk? Um, so if we've got like, say, 40, 45 minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, hello everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you. It's nice to be in the flesh giving a talk over the pandemic. We gave lots of talks, but always in a little, in a little screen, and you, you cannot have feedback to see whether your people are following you or you just left them behind. So by all means, uh, interrupt if uh, you need to interrupt. Uh, I might go a little bit quick because, as always, I have far too many slides. Uh, <clears throat> so let's see what, how, how far we can, we can go with it. Uh, first, I will tell you a little bit about the, uh, our, our research group, just to, to have an idea of what the background uh, uh, to all this research is. Then I will spend quite a lot of time about the motivation for this work, because I think perhaps the most important thing is the motivation rather than the solution that I propose. Uh, because although I think the solution we have is a good one, maybe you can come up with a better one, but those problems are still there. And, and this is why I will spend quite a a bit of time on the motivation. Then uh, what I believe are some of the foundations for a solution to the problems during that, uh, for, for, for the problems I will mention. I will uh, put it all together in this software system. Well, it's not only software, it's software and, and biological protocols, laboratory protocols uh, called self-repo. And, uh, and then what we are doing next, what we started to do and, and for where, where we need a, a help from people like you sitting in, in, in this audience. So let's start <coughs> with the group. Our research group is called the Interdisciplinary Computing and Complex Biosystems Research Group. We are, uh, we oscillate between 55 plus or minus five people o o o over time, that's a steady state. Uh, half of them are computational mathematics uh, or physics folks. The other half are uh, in the lab and in the lab, there is some of them that do microbiology, others do uh, DNA, RNA, nano nanotechnology. Uh, the, 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 the work I will describe here uh, has contribution from, ma from many of the, of the PIs and their teams, so uh, feel free to send emails later to me or to any of those folks later to, to, to ask questions or engage with different parts of the, of the talk. So, <coughs> to start with, I think the the, the, the thing that motivate, motivated us to embark on this, uh, on this adventure was to try to improve all these aspects in uh, the way engineer biology uh, works. Right now, it's very difficult to have good systems for engineering cell lines and to do it in a way that is scalable, traceable, collaborative, uh, uh, transparent. Those kind of tools are very fragmented or they are not there altogether. And I think it's time that we start uh, thinking in earnest about the, 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 those things. So, so to start with, uh, some of you here might actually be involved day to day on engineering cell lines. Uh, think about um, how do you get data about your strains? Where do you get those strains? Where do you source them from? Or if you don't uh, source entire strains from somebody else, who do you get your plasmids or your operons or your genetic circuits? Where do those come from? How, how, how do you know that you get what, uh, what you're supposed to get? So all, all of these are very real questions and there are no very good solutions right, right, right now. Unlike in other domains of uh, uh, technological activities that, that, that humans do. Now, compounding to that is a problem that biology is moving fast. In fact, by, uh, uh, engineering biology is moving very fast. You have lots of progress in developing uh, standards, uh, developing um, uh, 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 
domain specific languages such as ESBOL or, or another one that we also work on, the Infobiotic uh, uh, Workbench Description Language. Uh, there are lots of tools for doing simulations. Some of those tools are very generic, like, uh, like this Infobiotics Workbench that we have or the Symbiotics that allows you to do multi-scale modeling uh, of uh, bacterial colonies. And some other uh, 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 software suites are incredibly sophisticated for very specific uh, things that and, 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 and you have excellent work here done by uh, Lucia and, 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 and colleagues on uh, horse cell models and all of this. So there is a lot of progress on everything related to computer-aided design for uh, cell engineering. And of course you have also pro progress in liquid handling platforms. Some of them are open source, some of them are propri proprietary. Uh, <clears throat> and and, and, and to, on top of this, you have advances in fundamental science, things like CRISPR that now we use, in, everybody uses in, in the lab. 10 years ago was a curiosity, or maybe not even there. So, so the basic science is advancing fast, but also the technology that, we, that allows us to deploy and, and use that basic science is progressing very fast. Now, the... Uh, and not only is engineering biology moving fast, it's accelerating because we are being be uh, learning to do this cycle much better. We are b designing stuff, building stuff, testing it, and learning from those tests much faster. There is still big gaps here on the test and characterizing, but this loop is being starting to traverse uh, 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 faster. There are entire companies, unicorn companies, big multinational companies that are entirely predicated about doing this very, very fast. But still, engineering biology is hard. It's very, very hard. And uh, in particular, modifying cells, modifying plasmids, modifying cells, still requires a hell of a lot of trial and error. And when you try to uh, take descriptions from what is in papers, even when you have reasonably detailed supplemental material reproduce it in the lab, chances are you are not going to, uh, uh, you, 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 you are not going to get it. So we have big problems in terms of reproducibility. And this has been recognized in the, in the specialized uh, press. Uh, every month or two months, you have some uh, headlines like, uh, uh, like that. And this is because you don't really have, uh, until now, a way of collecting the complete digital footprint, the complete history of how an engineer cell came to be, came into the world. Where that cell started, who changed it, what changes were made there, what was the intent behind those changes, and how you can culture that, those, those cell lines. So there are big problems of, uh, of uh, reproducibility. <coughs> Compounded with this, there are also big problems with traceability. Okay, you may be able to reproduce some experiment, but to trace where a given engineer cell line go, who is using it, and how, where the data is used, is also not uh, easy to ascertain. In fact, it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to ascertain. And this have implications not only for the work that we do every day in the lab, but also have very real world implications in terms of what is called access and benefit sharing and IP management. So you might know that the Convention of Biological Diversity is meeting in Montreal next month, early next month, and one of the sticking points why it has not been ratified by member countries is because the access and benefit sharing, there is no agreement yet, we are just a few weeks away from this, on how digital sequence information is going to share, not only the biological resources themselves, the actual samples, but the digital information about that. So there is a big tension because most of the biological diversity in the world come from underdeveloped countries or countries or developing countries. But most of the exploitation is done by corporations in uh, uh, rich countries. The natives, where the samples come from, they don't get benefit from this. So this is a key point of contention. How do you trace, trace uh, uh, the, the origin, who, who got the samples and the digital secret information, so then everybody, the original countries, get the benefit from this. Not only the big pharma or the big agricultural 
a, 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 a complex. So traceability has implications also at the level of global governance of how these resources are, are, are shared and, and distributed. And then if, if you are, uh, let's say, skeptical or cynical about global gov governance framework, notwithstanding Nagoya has been very successful up to, the, uh, up to this point, then you can try to be a little bit more pragmatic and say, okay, but how does this affect uh, the bottom line potentially of a spin outs you may want to, to develop? Well, actually, you need to be very careful because there are lots of cases, again, appearing in the specialized media, sometimes in the public media, that shows that there are lots of cracks and, uh, where you can fall through by not being careful about the usage of the IP, of biotechnological IP, as any other uh, uh, IP. The other, the other motivation that perhaps is, the, it was the original one that we started with, is the collaboration. We had a very large uh, project that finishes at the end of, of this month, uh, at the end of December, sorry, that was started several years ago. There were multiple labs. We were going to do lots of genetic engineering. And uh, we need to agree on which strains we were going to use. Well, uh, when we started looking in detail at those strains, uh, we realized very early on that people have been using certain strains for close to a decade without actually knowing what was inside those strains. Because each single lab was looking at a very small part of the, of the genome and, and modifying just very small parts of it. This can work when you work in, in a very reductionist point of view, looking at, let's say, one protein or, 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 or a transcription factor or some signal, a specific signal in cascade. But when you're trying to do engineering biology that requires a more integrative systems biology understanding of your cellular uh, host, this definitely does not work. So we need to find some ways of, of working better with this. And, and the, other, the other point to, to illustrate is that those of you that work in the lab will, will I, I am willing to bet you will receive emails quite frequently of this nature like this. Does anybody has a strain that has this but doesn't have that? Well, imagine if software engineering was done in that way. Does anybody has a library that calculates Fourier, Fourier transform? No, 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 nobody does this in software engineering. This was how we were doing things 30, 40 years ago. Now what you do is you go to GitHub, you go to GitLab, you go to Bitbucket, and you check what libraries are there, you search, you check what libraries are there to do what you need, and you pick the one that has better quality. For example, have more forks, there are more contributed, contributors, passes more tests, so it's a certain measure of quality from what you, you use. But I'll come back to this in a minute. Then there is the issue of transparency. <coughs> because we do not collaborate properly, there is no proper integrated system, it's unclear what was the motivation behind the different mod modifications that people have introduced in the cell lines. So th there has been quite a lot, this is just one example here, but there has been quite a lot of effort of trying to predict the laboratory of origin for a given strain. But why on earth do we need to predict where we could know and we should know exactly where a given strain or a given plasmid uh, uh, come from? So when you, when you can be more transparent in the way that you do research, either it doesn't matter whether you make it publicly transparent or you keep it within your lab, you can progress faster because you learn from your errors, you learn from your mistakes, and you can build projects on top of previous projects. But again, those kind of tools were not there before. Now, engineering biology, as I say the earlier, is becoming more powerful. We can do more things, more complex things, systems, and faster. And with this, come with more power comes more responsibility. And responsive innovation is absolutely crucial. Because one thing is to introduce a bug in a piece of software. Another thing is to introduce a bug in an agricultural crop. That's something you most definitely don't want to do. And if you do do it, you want to be transparent so you can trace it back to the source of the ori origin of the bug so you can correct it. So to be able to discharge uh, responsive innovation, we need to do all of those things we, we said uh, uh, earlier. You need to collaborate better, be more transparent, more traceable. And if all of this has not convinced you, then let's think about money. Money, which at the end of the day is what pays all our salaries, uh, whether it's because it comes from 
industry or from the taxpayer, somebody's paying for all of this. Now, we did some, um, some early, uh, uh, it's not market research, it's uh, user research, and um, we find out that across UK universities, laboratories, up to 30% of the money spent in the laboratory is spent trying to reproduce things that somebody else has done and that never work. 30% is a ginormous number, enormous. So there are solutions for this. The software industry has solved it with version control systems, as I will tell you in a minute, and other technologies, uh, but we are not using it yet. And this is becoming more important because this is the prediction of a market research that we commissioned to the Center for Process Innovation in Darlington to do for us. They calculate, they estimate that in 2023, next year, the market for microbial and microbially derived product will be $300 billion. It's a big number, very big number. So the foundation for trying to, to tackle those, those problems is uh, uh, th th there are things that we will need to adapt and, and discover a new and create new stuff, but there are some elements that we can bring from other disciplines. And I think this boils down to these three things that if I have time, I will walk you through, through, through all of those. Let's start with digital twins. <coughs> so, so what is a digital twin? Essentially, it's a virtual representation. It's a computer representation of a physical entity. And the idea is, that that virtual representation, that computer model, uh, should, in an ideal case, capture all the scales, all the way from the subatomic to the macromolecular state, and, in an ideal case, be linked with the real thing, so you can collect data from the real thing, update your model, and use your model to drive the real thing. Now, that's the idea, okay, the, 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 the utopia. Now, this has been used already for many, many years in logistic manufacturing, the energy sector, uh, and in, 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 in other deep technology uh, uh, settings. It started many decades ago with uh, essentially the, the space uh, race, because when they started to put probes in other planets where the light delay for commands and, and uh, for, for, for sending new commands and retrieving information was too slow, they needed to be able to experiment quickly locally on Earth, and then send commands with more certainty of what to do to the, to, to the probes. And of course, once a probe is in another planet, you cannot change it. So you need to, you, you need to have something that allows you to, 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 to try to ascertain what is going wrong or, uh, with, with the probe. So this started with, uh, with NASA. And, and I think this one, this quote here from General Electric is very, is very impressive. They, they create nuclear reactors, uh, wind turbines, uh, uh, of course, diesel engines, and a number of other machines. For every engine they put out in the real world, they have a digital twin. And that digital twin is physically connected to the virtual, uh, to the virtual uh, team. And what this means is that they can continuously improve the process of governance of that infrastructure. Now, they are used, digital twins are used in all those areas of the life cycle of a product development. And if you ask yourself, in which of those areas of the life cycle of a synthetic biology product you could use a digital twin, the answer is, when you look into detail, is all of them. We should be trying to create digital twins and creating as sophisticated models as possible for each one of those areas. The models will have very different nature. It's not the same kind of model to, uh, that you use for uh, manufacturing something than when you do uh, quality control or when you want to, um, uh, how to say, uh, 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 re remove from the environment something. There will be different kind of models. The way you will collect data will be different. But having the feasibility of having this digital twin will save time, will give you confidence that what you are doing, the intervention in the real world, is, uh, uh, is, is a safe intervention. The next, the next uh, foundation is version control. Some of you that are more on the computer science, perhaps the mathematics side of you, you will be familiar with it. But essentially, it's a tool that allows you to change, uh, uh, to, to manage how you track, how, how you change source files for code, for software code. 
Now, version control has also been used for other things. When you edit uh, in collaborative mode a, a, a Word document, you also keep, uh, create different versions and you can see who, may, who changed what. And what this allows you to do is to work in, with confidence in your piece of the work, even though it might be a, a, a small part of a larger uh, thing. And then eventually you can merge or reject changes that somebody else did. But the version control not only allows you to do that, to, to, to manage those, those conflicts, it also keeps a ledger of what happened to your codes. And this means that when you have found an error, you can always go back and track where that error came from and make a correction. Without, soft, without this, it's virtually impossible to do any kind of software engineering at scale. Now, for those of you that don't know version control, I, I suggest you, you get this book, very simple, very accessible, to the point. And if you are interested in that board, you can try to search for the colorful life of the inventor of all of this, which is an act, act a total genius, but not a very pleasant person, apparently. So, so, so the, 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 how you say, the, the folk stories about uh, Torvald says. Anyway, so how does it work? You start with a piece of software, or could be some other documentation, and you start to change it. You change, you make a change, and another change. Somebody else might pick this change and branch and create a new idea and do its own changes. And then if these new changes are good, you can merge it, and at this point, you have the joint merge history of all of these that happened before, plus all of this. There might be some conflicts that you need to resolve. But version control allows you to do this in a systematic, unified, clear, uh, clear way. And the way it does this is by using uh, these three concepts, repository, branches, and commits. So a repository essentially is a central file location where you collect all your files, everything that goes into creating a piece of software. And then you can connect to this repository remotely what from a client. So multiple people can be working on those files in the local clients, and then you upload to the cloud the, uh, your, your, own, your own versions. The branches are those line histories. So somebody takes a document, makes some modification, this can be in one line. If you need to do something radically different, then you can branch it, do a different modification, you create a different branch. Those branches could live forever separately, or you may decide to, uh, to measure late, later on. And then the other concept is a concept of commit. And commit is an atomic change. Unlike transactional databases where, where once you do a commit, the data gets there forever and you cannot change, in this case, you make a commit in the version control system, and if somebody wants, can go and do a commit that overrides that one. Or you can go to an earlier version by going several commits earlier. So every commit has a timestamp and has an ID and has other metadata such as who is the author of that commit, which computer did that commit. That's very important because it adds transparency to the who question, who did something to this code. So this is an example. Suppose that my, my, my wife says, well, we need to do a shopping list. So I tell her, okay, let's create a version control of the shopping list. So she goes and she adds some things to the shopping list, and then I create my own branch, and I add whatever it is that I need to add. Each one of the things I need to add is a commit. I add something else and something else. Then my, my, my kids want to add whatever it is that they want to add, and then we can all merge into the main branch, and at the end here, we have the collective history of all of this that happened before. At each of these merging points, we could have rejected this. Maybe you, we didn't want to, my wife said, no, you know what, we're not going to buy anything you wanted to buy. Reject that branch, okay? That's what version control allows you to do in a transparent way where everybody involved in the running of a project can, can, can see it. Okay, so what does all of this have to do with cell engineering? Let's translate this to something more specific to, to, to what we are talking here. So what we built is, uh, we thought, okay, this is great, but it's just too complicated for, uh, uh, for cell engineering. We, there are lots of things on uh, Git version control that is very, very specific to software and doesn't necessarily translate to uh, cell engineering. So we simplified lots of things, 
And we added also the possibility of physically linking the commits in the cloud with a, a living cell. So what uh, this, am I, am I going in the right direction? Uh, yes, so what this allows you to do is to track all the cell engineering resources that you have, cell lines, plasmids, uh, uh, and, and creates a, a, a limited version of a digital twin. It is limited because it's a snapshot of how you have engineered an organism in a given moment. It's not a dynamic simulation of, the, of, of that uh, organism. But I'll, but I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute. So a repository, in our case then, essentially is an experiment that might have one or more strains I might have more, one or more branches. And each branch is a sequence of changes that you do to a cell line. And each commit is a specific change. For example, a knockout or a knock-in or something like that. So <coughs> how it works is that there is a repository in the cloud and uh, you uh, want to search for some uh, strain. You want to start a project, let's say, with some particular uh, uh, e. coli strain, VL21, whatever, you search it, and the system will create a master branch. This is essentially a, a clean project where you start from the wild type. You don't necessarily need to start from the wild type. You can start from something that somebody else did before. And then you start adding, um, uh, uh, adding, adding mod modifications, and adding modifications to your strain, you can, uh, you, you can change that plasmids or whatever is it that, that you are adding to, to, to your stain, creating those commits in the digital in the digital repository. You're recording the process of engineering your cell line. And then somebody may want to say, okay, I don't care about all these changes here, but I really like this because this point in time captures all this previous history of changes that you have. So you can start a new a new project. Now, each of these commits has a unique ID. The system gives you a unique uh, 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 time-stamped uh, time ID. And this is com converted into a DNA barcode. So the way it looks like is that you could start, for example, with a wild type. You do some knockouts, some knock-ins. You do some plasmid transformation. You modify you do some mutagenesis in a promoter. And you end up with this phenotype here. A month later, yourself or a collaborator or somebody else looks at this and say, oh, well, I, I actually don't care about all of this, but I care about this bit here. Can I recover this and reuse that? So you can branch from here and do further genetic engineering. So at this point, you have a new genotype, a new phenotype that has all this engineering history, okay? And that's as recorded in the, in the cloud system. But then you can do another step, which is to, to link your actual physical sample to those uh, records in the cloud. So what you do is you convert that commit ID into a genetic barcode, a DNA, a short, relatively short DNA barcode that have certain, certain structure. Uh, uh, in fact, in the website, in the, in the system now, there are several versions of different barcodes we have. This is the simplest one we originally started with. But, but the principle is the same. It's a, it's a unique identifier. It's not going to repeat within the system. It's biologically orthogonal. When we generate that barcode, we make sure that there are no, within this DNA sequence, there are no restriction sites, no regulatory sequence. There is no uh, um, um, uh, coding sequences or, or anything like that. We have done lots and lots of experiments to show that it's stable under a number of conditions. For example, taking a barcoded strain and putting into a, a bioreactor for many, many, many generations and then checking number of mutations or bar taking a barcoding strain and then doing lots of additional genetic engineering because this introduces lots of stress on the cell. And when the cell is stressed, uh, uh, there, there are mut mut mutational effects. So, so we have made sure that these two conditions satisfies. And at that point, it, it, you end up linking your biological sample with information in the, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the cloud. Now, if somebody then receives a sample of this strain, 
then what happened is that you can, uh, okay, so this is what, what happened. You, you do your strain development, you commit it into the site, you convert this to a DNA barcode, it's inserted into the cell, and then this cell is pointing to that particular commit that you have and has access to all this documentation. On the other side of the equation, if somebody receives your sample, what they do is they barcode, they sequence only these little barcodes, they introduce it in, in, the, in the cloud control system, version control system, and you can recover all the information about the, the cell. So like this, you link, the, the sample already contains a link, a physical link to the documentation. Uh, this is a little, uh, uh, just an example of how it looked like. That's a little bit tall now, there are more functionalities, but, but it gives the idea. You can start with the first commit, started with a wild type uh, in Bacillus subtilis wild type, and then Jonathan uh, introduced a, a GFP there, okay? So, and if you look inside how the commit look like, you will have the barcode, and, and in this particular one shows you that there is a digital barcode and a physical barcode. It means that you actually have that barcode mapped to DNA inside, in, inside the cell, and there are some, there's some metadata about this and some documentation that, that you could add. And, and this is the other commit, so it's, it's a little bit different. Some of the metadata will be similar, some of them will be different. The barcodes will be different. We have done barcodes, a protocol for a, l l several of the most, uh, let's say, the most uh, common um, uh, uh, microbes. Um, that you can see here, and for some of them we have several se several bar uh, protocols. I will not go through, through them. I will just show it show it to you. So you have lambda range recombinating, CRISPR, for E. coli, for subtilis. You have toxin antitoxin, Crelox, CRISPR, uh, uh, streptomyces. You have CRISPR for Cerevisia. You have Crelox and CRISPR uh, for Picha pastorix. This is the most common genetic engineering uh, tool that people use for. So we, we have used the same one uh, for Pseudomonas putti that we have um, the barcoding is based on the group in, intros group group two. So 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 you can you can play. Essentially, it doesn't matter the barcode the, the protocol for barcode. You can use any anything that will introduce the barcode because the system gives you the barcode. You can introduce any way that you are familiar with, and and and, and you, you usually. Um, the, the protocols can be simplified because you don't always need to remove the selection marker used to get uh, the, the barcode strains. So, so, so those are uh, all publicly uh, available. Now, <coughs> what we haven't done yet, is, and we're looking for collaborators, is to work with people that are interested on barcoding mammalian cells. Barcoding in mammalian cells has been used for, for ages, for, 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 for at least a decade or two, for, for completely different purposes. So we would like to collaborate with somebody that wants to look in earnest how to optimize those barcoding protocols for mammalian cells so we can link them to, uh, to, to, to what we have. So what you get at the end is this link between the physical sample and the digital uh, cloud. So you map this unique identifier that the version control system gives you uh, maps it to DNA, and then the cell end up having the complete, uh, an access to the complete engineering history of, uh, of, of the cell. And, and it's a very simple concept, but I, I think it's quite interesting. I, I, I still find it very interesting because somehow it's like augmenting the genome of the cell. It, the cell has its genome plus a metagenome, or rather, let's not call it metagenome because that is a word that has a different me uh, 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 meaning. It's like a supragenome. You have additional instructions in the cell that tells you how to manufacture the cell, how that cell was manufactured, how you can grow it, how you can uh, 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 keep it, etc. So, may I make a question on this? Topic? Yes. Uh, so, the, the cell will uh, store all the barcodes of all the you, you always you always need to store the last one, because the cloud system keeps track of the history and, for you. And the other barcodes have to be removed from the genome, must be edited out. Yes, you can you can you don't need you don't need to remove it, but it's better to remove it. The way we have defined the protocols is that yes, one will remove the other, so okay. you overwrite and you always keep the latest. Okay. okay? But I'll, I'll show you a minute a case where you don't necessarily need to have the latest barcode. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. 
So, so what you have is that the you make changes to your sample and you store it in the repository. The repository now is actually generate a unique digital signature that depends on the files that have been stored in there and your own private key and that gets converted into DNA. And you can send that sample to somebody else and that person can sequence this and confirm and verify that what they have received is what they were expecting to receive. Okay, so that, that's what we have now. But the question is, does this solve all the problems that I was mentioning before? And unfortunately, the answer is no, not entirely. It doesn't solve all the problems. And uh, coming back to, to your question, to imagine that, uh, that you receive in the lab, somebody built all of this, one group built this, another different group for make a branch and build this, and a third group received this, final product. Okay? Now, that final product does not necessarily have a new barcode. You are not obliged to physically barcode the thing. We leave this to the user of the system to decide when to physically uh, barcode because there are some time implications in doing the barcode. But what this one will see is the barcode of the previous uh, commit. But that's fine because when you go to the system from this previous commit, from this barcode, you will, re you will be able to navigate down and identify what you have, but also navigate to this story. But the problem is that although this captured this story perfectly well, it doesn't tell you what happened here with that knocking gene or that knocked in gene here. Where is that gene coming from? Where is that sequence coming from? And this is what it could happen, okay? And this is called a man in the middle attack. You are, all, all of the things that we do, essentially we, we don't do it by, by hand, we use some computers, and usually through a web browser. So a man in the middle attack introduces a malicious plugin in your browser. So you design your gene that you want to introduce, for, for example, this one or this one. You design the gene and you send it to manufacture, okay? You send it to IDT to, to, to manufacture. Give me six. <laughs> you say to manufacture. What happens is that the malicious plugin changes the sequence. It goes through all the checks process of the manufacturing synthesis company, and you receive back the malicious sequence. But because you analyze it with your plugin, that your browser that has been compromised, you think you have what you ordered, but you don't. You may have something uh, 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 malicious. And then you transform it, and using CRISPR or some other fancy technique, you create something that actually could be quite dangerous. And this paper is a demonstration that this actually can happen, okay? Now, this is what is called a vulnerability in the supply chain. And this has happened and happens in the energy sector, in the manufacturing of goods and products, and in the software sector. We have seen it, the situation in Ukraine with the energy supply chain, and we have seen every, everywhere else. Now, to, to secure the supply chain of something is a very difficult problem, very, very complex physical problem that involves lots of, uh, uh, lots of different factors, political, uh, social, te te technological factors. But the first step to solve this is that they rely on what is called a bill of material. And a bill of material is something that was used to uh, optimize supply chain management of physical goods already 60 years ago. This was introduced in the 60s. But believe it or not, only 10 years ago, it was introduced for software. And it was introduced for software only 10 years ago, but only last year, there was a, an American presidential directive that this needed to be taken seriously. Why? Because there has been an incredibly uptake of attacks on the supply chain of software. So people have been trying to subvert the version control systems that are out, out there. And one famous case is the solar wind, that's somewhere here, I think, is a solar wind case where the supply chain of the buildup of the solar wind software then uh, was compromised and they distributed software all over the place in America. To this day, they are not entirely certain that all the implications of, of that uh, hack. Now, <coughs> in software, you have a 
a, a, a system, a, a, a look very similar that we have in engineering biology. You also design, you build, you test, you deploy, eventually you decommission. And you go through this cycle many times. But at each point, there are lots of uh, uh, artifacts that comes into the building of a software. Source codes, data files, configuration files, virtual instances, uh, compute servers, etc. If you want to be able to understand and harden your supply chain, you need to have a good bill of material, which essentially is a hierarchical list of all the things that make up your object, whether it's a tangible physical object or a virtual thing like a, 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 a software. Strain engineering has similarities to both. You have physical thing, which is your strain, but also it depends on lots of digital artifacts, like I, that we were talking before with, with cell rep. And the inge an engineering biology bill of material needs to be able to integrate those things. But we do not have yet an engineering biology bill of material. And it's something that we are sorely uh, missing. In, in an early paper with, with Victor De Lorenzo and, and, and Marcus, we, uh, we suggested some of the things that should be included in a bill of material without actually calling a bill of material at, at, at the time. Uh, and now we are working on extending this version thing that we have, the barcodes and the versions, with creating a list of material of everything that goes into building your uh, uh, engineering strengths. And, and to finish, with, it, with, with this I will finish. To be able to do this properly, it, it, it's not something that can come from one lab. This needs to be a community effort. Because there are lots of different moving paths. You have lots of different software, and there is a lot of fragmentation on the software side of this, on the digital side of things. There is the issue of a, 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 a genetic sequence information, digital sequence information that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, and then there are the physical components the sequences of DNA, the plasmids, the operons that, that, that you source, the bio bricks that, that you may use, and the actual strains uh, uh, themselves. So uh, to conclude, what I would uh, like to do is to, uh, to invite you to get involved with this. We are going to run a workshop sometime in 2013, in the first half of 2013, that will be a half tutorial of what we already have, but the other half will be brainstorming about what needs to come into the definition of that engineering biology bill of material. Because the time is coming. We cannot wait until the equivalent of solar wind happen before we start uh, moving in the area. Because if something really happened bad in the supply chain of our agriculture, for example, or in our medical supply chain, the consequences will be uh, much more uh, serious and deadly. And with this, I will finish. Thank you very much.